We're at our last session, and we're looking at the New Covenant. And some of you who up to this point have liked what I said, after this point, maybe you won't like what I said. Um, I do take a, a minority view in dispensationalism. I think it's a minority view on the New Covenant. Um, and this is where you're going to find in this book, um, my view, along with two other views, and we interact with each other, all of us within dispensationalism. Um, one of the unfortunate things about being here in this conference is one of my very dear friends, also has a, an article in this book on the New Covenant, Dr. Compton. We still like each other. I think we will after this session. <laughs> I hope we will. I love Dr. Compton. But we disagree on, uh, on, on the New Covenant. Um, and, you know, I think, there's, I think there's something healthy about disagreement within dispensationalism and iron sharpening iron. And, I mean, it shows that dispensationalists are thinking and they're interacting and they're working through various positions. So I think there's something very healthy about Dr. Compton and I and others, you know, disagreeing on the subject. Besides, if I agreed with Dr. Compton, then we'd both be wrong. <laughs> we can't let that happen, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, Bruce. I, I, had a, I heard somebody use that a few weeks ago. I thought, i got to use that. That's okay. okay, we're going to have to fly through some material here that's, again, it's controversial. It's... You're going to have to think with me. You may disagree with me. You know, let's rub iron against iron. Go, go home and, you know, take this, think about it, get the book, uh, read it, um, email me if you want to talk about it. But let's do some thinking about the New Covenant, at least from the perspective that I'm going to see it uh, through the lens of both ancient and Eastern covenants and how they work. But I think more importantly, uh, through the lens of Scripture and how I believe the New Covenant is presented in the text of Scripture. So, um, we're going to try to fly through this and see how, uh, how much we're able to cover. Kingdom Covenants of Scripture, Session 3, the New Covenant contextualizing the kingdom to come. In other words, I'm going to suggest that the New Covenant is about the kingdom to come, that is Christ reestablishing the historic kingdom at his second advent. When he comes, he will cut the covenant with Israel, and that's the function and the purpose and the nature of the new covenant. It is tied to Israel's future. Covenant theologians, of course, are going to say that the new covenant is part and parcel of the covenant of grace. The new covenant is now you know, the way the covenant of grace is working and, uh, you know, Israel is no longer, has no future. We are under the new covenant. The new covenant replaces everything in the past and there is no future for Israel. It's, it's all typologically, spiritually fulfilled in the church. Uh, new covenant theologians or progressive covenant theologians do not believe in a covenant of grace, but they do believe that the new covenant is now fully in effect in the church, that it has replaced the old covenant, which was over Israel. The new covenant is over the church. All of the things promised to Israel physically and literally are never going to happen. They're fulfilled in a greater way spiritually in the church. The church replaces Israel. So they're falling into pretty much the same uh, consequence of the covenant as the covenant theologians themselves. Progressive dispensationalists like Bach and Blazing and others say that the new covenant is both already fulfilled in part in the church, spiritually, non literally, as we just looked at Joel 2 and Acts 2. It's an inaugurated fulfillment of the new covenant on the day of Pentecost in a way different than the prophets predicted. Uh, but yet there's a future for Israel and there will be a future literal fulfillment of the new covenant. Many dispensationalists, maybe most, I mean, I don't know how to take a vote on this, but many dispensationalists say that the church participates in the new covenant. At least the church participates in the spiritual blessings of the new covenant and the new covenant was ratified at the cross. That's a very, very common position 
in dispensationalism. Most of my friends are there, um, but uh, I, I'm going to disagree with that. Here's my premise, and hang on to your hats and give me 50 minutes and then, you know, go at me during the Q&A. Um, my premise is that the church today participates in some soteriological blessings like are promised to Israel in the New Covenant. The church, however, has no legal relationship to the New Covenant. We do not participate in the New Covenant in any way. And again, that's going to be my position of the three major positions in this book, and I'm going to interact with, uh, with the others on, uh, on their views, right? I believe that there are at least five common fallacies with regard to the New Covenant. Number one, Many believe, and both this is both um, dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists, many believe that the new covenant is a grant-type covenant. It's like the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant. Um, that, that is, it's a grant that God swears, only God swears to the terms. And I'm going to disagree with that. Uh, many believe that the new covenant incorporates all of the covenants. That is, all of the other biblical covenants kind of are subsumed by and dump into the new covenant. So the new covenant is the fulfillment of all the covenants. Mostly that's going to be, um, you know, covenant theologians who subsume everything under the new covenant. Um, there are some who believe the new covenant, many who believe or look at the new covenant as a soteriological covenant. That is that salvation through Christ constitutes the essence of the new covenant. This is so prominent. It's another thing I wish I could somehow, you know, erase from the culture of, of the New Covenant, that somehow the New Covenant is a soteriological covenant. You know, when Jeremiah says, I'm going to make a New Covenant, I'm going to put my spirit in them, I'm going to, you know, pour out my spirit, and I'm going to put the law in their hearts and so forth, that this is like, and forgive their sins and so forth. This is like, this is what's new. It's like this soteriological stuff is like brand new. Nobody ever heard of this before. And now there's salvation by faith, you know, through through the coming Messiah. Um, we, we shouldn't look at the new covenant that way, and I'll show you why, um, in my opinion. Number four, many believe that the new covenant, many, probably most people believe that the new covenant was ratified at the cross, that Christ's sacrifice ratified, inaugurated, or somehow put into action the new covenant. Um, and then the church participates in the new covenant. That is, some of the legal benefits of the new covenant are already being experienced by the church. I think those are fallacies, and I'm going to do my best to dissuade you of those. Uh, take it for what it's worth when we get to the end. The New Covenant is foretold in numerous passages. I haven't listed them all here. The time and the place of ratification where it is cut is specifically mentioned in a number of places, and a little later on we'll, we'll go to those texts. Roman number one, the New Covenant in the Old Testament. Before we understand the New Covenant in the New Testament, we have to understand the New Covenant in the Old Testament. Remember I said that McCune, as my mentor, taught me something incredibly valuable. The better I understand the Old Testament, the better I understand the New Testament. There's really a lot of truth to that. Um, but we, we, cannot start, we cannot start our study of the New Testament of the king, I'm sorry, we cannot start our study of the new covenant in the book of Matthew or Romans or anywhere in the New Testament. We've got to start our study of the new covenant in the Old Testament. Just like we can't start our study of the kingdom in the New Testament. How many people have erred by, you know, we start our study of George Ladd, we start our study of the kingdom in the New Testament because the New Testament is going to redefine the Old Testament. Seriously. I don't think so. Let's start, you know, let's start with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division before we get to, you know, algebra and trigonometry and stuff, right? So we need to start in the Old Testament. Letter A, evidence of the classification of the new covenant. Many believe the new covenant is a grant. I believe that the new covenant is very clearly a suzerainty covenant. It's a bilateral suzerainty covenant. Here's why I believe that. Number one, it's legal in content. Remember every time I said I had the little, the capital letter law, suzerainty covenants are about law, law for the nation. 
What does Jeremiah 31 say the new covenant's going to do? I will write my law in their hearts. The new covenant is, is law. And law is suzerainty covenant. Grand covenants are blessings and benefits, not law. Um, the new covenant is bilateral in nature. The vassals swear to the terms. And I've got Hosea 2 there, Zechariah 13. I'm going to get to those later. But I'm going to show you that the, the Old Testament explicitly tells us that the new covenant is cut between God and Israel. They both swear to the terms. That's not true of a grant kind of covenant. That's unilateral. This one's bilateral. Thirdly, it's theocratic in purpose. That is, it, it is national in party and scope. Ezekiel 37, the first part of that chapter is the dry bones, right? The second part of that chapter, 15 to 28, is the tying together the two st sticks, Ephraim and, and Judah. I'm going to make them one nation. They're going to have one king. They're going to have one sanctuary. They're going to have one law, Right? So when Israel becomes a nation again, when Israel's restored to its national theocratic status, it's going to have a law. And the law is the new covenant um, that's going to replace the old covenant as the constitution of the nation, letter B. That's the purpose of the new covenant. The new covenant stands as the constitution of the restored theocracy. Just like the Mosaic covenant was the constitution of the historic kingdom, so the new covenant becomes the constitution of the restored theocracy. Its laws, there's that word again, govern the relationship between the sovereign and the subject nation. The new covenant is cut with a nation, not with an individual. Suzerainty treaties are made between sovereigns and nations. Grants are made with individuals, right? Its laws govern the relationship between the sovereign and the subject nation. It's, it is intergenerational and perpetual. It will never become obsolete. That is, this covenant cut with Israel will last until the end of time and never become obsolete. Until, of course, the end of time when the Christ's kingdom is over. He submits the, the kingdom to the Father and the eternal state begins. So the relationship of the covenants. And remember my little diagram at the end of last session. Here's how we're going to fit the new covenant in there. And uh, the, the first time I ever saw this umbrella illustration was when I was at Grace Seminary. And my Old Testament prof was going through the covenants and, and he had these umbrellas. And I liked it. He had Abrahamic covenant. There's an ethnic covenant. Under that is the Mosaic covenant, which is, you know, creates the laws for the nation. Under that is the Davidic covenant, which creates the king of the nation made of this ethnic group. And then he drew a big upside down umbrella underneath that. And he said, here's the new covenant and all the other covenants dump into the new covenant and they're all fulfilled in the new covenant. It's like, Okay, okay, wait a minute. Um, new covenant. What does new covenant assume? I mean, that's Jeremiah's point, right? That there is an old covenant. So what would you think the new covenant would do? If the old covenant was the law of the kingdom in history, we're going to have the kingdom restored in the eschaton to Israel. They're going to need a constitution, right? There's going to be a theocrat in Jerusalem on a throne. There's going to be a temple, the restoration of Israel to its favored nation status. All that stuff's going to happen. And in order to have a theocratic kingdom nation, you have to have law. The new covenant, I have it here, bumping out the old covenant and replacing it in the eschaton as the constitution of national Israel. It makes, sense. it makes sense to me. The, old, the new covenant replaces the old covenant as the constitution of Israel, and it consists of everything that uh, suzerainty type covenants consist of. That is law, national extent, bilateral agreement. Who are the legal beneficiaries and parties, page two? 
Who are the legal beneficiaries and parties of the new covenant? They're the same parties as the old covenant. God and the nation, Israel. God and the nation, Israel, are parties, the stated parties of the new covenant. And here's what I say, always and only God cutting the covenant with Israel, Judah, nationally. Here's where I challenge my students. Here's where I'll challenge you. I might be wrong. You correct me. But you find anywhere in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, Old Testament, New Testament, where the new covenant is said to be cut with anybody else. Okay, don't spend the rest of this hour looking for it. Number one, I don't think you'll find it. Uh, if you do, if you do, well, you know, talk to me later. Don't stand up in the middle of the session and say, you're wrong, Beecham, because then I'd have to sit down and shut up and they want me to talk for an hour, right? <laughs> okay, anyway, the legal beneficiaries of this covenant are always only Israel and God. And, and I challenge you to find this covenant anywhere in the Bible, whether you're in, you know, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or you're in Acts, or you're in Hebrews, it's always Israel and God. It's never anybody else. Okay, letter E. Uh, the time and the place of new covenant ratification. By the way, how are covenants ratified? What ratifies a covenant? When is this couple legally married? The vows, the oath, right? So, uh, a covenant is ratified at the point that the party or parties, party unilateral or parties bilateral, take the oath, swear the oath. Um, the, the, the Old Testament tells us when that's going to happen. Look at Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20, 33 to 44. I don't have time to read all of this, but let me skim it. Verse 33, Ezekiel 20. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you, and I shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered. Okay, I know you guys are... You know, you know, eschatology, right? When are we talking about here? At the end of the tribulation, at the end of, of, of seven years of tribulation and three and a half years of abject horror, Israel's going to be brought to their knees and God is going to bring them out from the scattered peoples at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with wrath poured out, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, the wilderness. Where did God cut the old covenant? That's interesting to me. The wilderness of the peoples. And there I shall enter into judgment with you face, and fa face to face as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord, and I shall make you pass under the rod and I shall bring you into the bond of the covenant. I shall purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I shall bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. In other words, at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, God is going to supernaturally gather all the Jews who are still alive on the face of this earth in their natural bodies who survived the tribulation. He's going to bring every last ethnic Jew at the end of the tribulation to the wilderness of the peoples and cause them like sheep to pass under the rod. He's going to dismiss those who are unbelievers and he is going to keep those for his kingdom who are believers. Go to uh, um, chapter 34, verse 11. It's a little more explicit there. Verse 10 of 34. Thus says the Lord, behold, I'm against the shepherds. I shall demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. Verse 13, I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land. Verse 17, 
As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another. This is passing under the rod like the shepherd. Which sheep are mine and which sheep aren't mine? I will judge between one sheep and another between the rams and the male goats. Verse 20, therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will even judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. It's going to kick out all the unbelieving Jews who survived the tribulation in natural bodies. He's going to keep all the believing Jews, verse 23. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David will be among them. And I will cut a covenant of peace with them. There it is. When is the new covenant cut? It's cut after a discriminating judgment at the conclusion of the 70th week of Daniel with all believing Israel because all the unbelievers have been cast out. And I've got here uh, Ezekiel 34, um, Hosea 2, Daniel 7, Jeremiah 31. Um, you know what? Let's go to Hosea 2 because I said I'd, I'd take you there. Hosea 2. Fourteen and eighteen. <clears throat> Remember, I said that um, the new covenant is a suzerainty covenant sworn to by both parties. It's not a grant where only God swears to the terms. It is a suzerainty covenant where both parties swear to the terms. Hosea two. Fourteen. I wish I had time to read all of this. Um, verse four, to go back to, well, yeah, verse 14. Is that what I said? 214. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. Okay, we're in, we're in Hosea, right? The whole Gomer story. Take a wife who's a harlot. She's going to leave you. Take her back again. I mean, that's the picture of Israel. Take a wife out of Egypt, Israel. She's going to play the harlot scattered among the nations, the curses, right? But I'm going to allure her. I'm going to make her a nation again. Verse 14, behold, I will allure her. I bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her and give her vineyards from there in the Valley of Acords, the door of hope in the day when she came up, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishi and no longer call me Baali for I will remove the names of the Baals. Verse 18, in that day I will cut a covenant for them. With the beasts in the field, the birds of the skies, the creeping things of the ground, I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war. Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice. How do you betroth someone? It's a bilateral, Right? You and your spouse both made vows at your wedding, right? Um, verse 20, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Verse 21, it will come about in that day. I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the heavens. They will respond to the earth. The earth will respond to the grain, the new wine to the oil. They will respond to Jezreel, which is playing back to the beginning of this book. Listen to this, verse 23, and I will sow her for myself in the land. I will have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. I will say to those who were not my people, my people. I will say to lo ami, ami, my people. And they will say, Elohav, my God. I will say, you are my people. You, they will say, you are my God. That's not bilateral. I don't know what is. Um, it's also likened to uh, a marriage, I think, in Jeremiah 31. Daniel 7 is actually going to give you the chronology of the fourth beast being slain. I love Daniel 7, verses 9, 11, and 13. Don't have time to go there. But you see in Daniel 7, the four beasts, like Nebuchadnezzar saw in chapter 2, only they were glorious there, right, that image. Daniel in chapter 7 sees four beasts. The last one is which is nondescript, horrible, Roman beast. And it says in Daniel 7, verse 9, that when the fourth beast is slain at the end of the tribulation period, thrones are set up in heaven. The Ancient of Days is seated on the throne. That's God the Father. 
And the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days in clouds. How's Christ going to return in clouds? That's a neat study. He comes to the Ancient of Days in clouds after the fourth beast is slain, and he receives, there is given to him a kingdom. And he comes in clouds. Zechariah, on the Mount of Olives in Israel, mourns and weeps. He gathers the Jews who survived the tribulation to the wilderness. He kicks out the unbelievers and he cuts the new covenant with the new nation of Israel, all of whom at that point in time are believers. What about the nations? Letter F, the nations in the new covenant. There are going to be nations, that is Gentiles, non-Jews, who survived the tribulation. Guess what happens to them? The non-Jews who survived the tribulation are going to be brought to the valley of Jehoshaphat, a different place. And what's going to happen to them? God's going to judge between the sheep and the goats. It's in um, Zechariah 8, Isaiah uh, 14, 1 and 2, and many other passages, not to mention Christ in, in Matthew 25, right? I'm going to bring the Gentiles into judgment. I'm going to kick out all the unbelieving Gentiles. All the saved believing Gentiles in natural bodies are going to enter the kingdom along with all of the believers in, in Israel. I'm going to cut the covenant with Israel. But just like under the old covenant, Gentiles can participate in the benefits and the blessings as long as they attach themselves to Israel. Covenants cut with Israel, Gentiles can only, you know, take the crumbs that fall off the table, but they'll want those crumbs and they'll all be believers at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So there will be nations there. Um, they can experience the covenant through Israel, but the covenant is cut with Israel. The perpetuity of the covenant is everlasting. Blessings and curses of the covenant there will be blessings, and I, I think, I've never seen this before, but under letter G, the perpetuity of the covenant, Isaiah 59, 21. When I read that passage, a lot of people have asked me, do you think there will eventually, you know, there'll be Jews in the millennial kingdom who will turn away from the Lord? And it seems to me, if I'm reading Isaiah 59 correctly, that all believing Jews at the beginning of the millennium cut the covenant with their God in the restored kingdom, and, and Isaiah 59 says, their children after them will worship their God in perpetuity. It seems to me like it's possible that the Jews in the millennium will all believe in God in perpetuity. They'll, they'll come to faith in perpetuity as the millennial kingdom progresses and new children are born, right? But the nations will have those who don't believe eventually as children are born those nations will eventually rebel against God at the end of the millennium. But I think the Jews and their descendants will remain faithful. At least that's how I'm reading Isaiah 59. Um, there will be curses on non-conforming nations, Zechariah 14, 16 to 19. You can look that up later. So my point is there are blessings and curses under this suzerainty covenant. Here are the promised benefits of the new covenant. And I'm getting... Most of this list from Ezekiel 36 and the very last one from Jeremiah 31. Um, and you know this list. Regathering, cleansing, a new heart, Holy Spirit internalization, um, you know, removal, number seven of the curses, repentance, forgiveness, number 12, internal law. If you look at that list, you'll see some bolded benefits. Those are often singled out as the spiritual benefits right? Cleansing, a new heart, Holy Spirit internalization, repentance, forgiveness, internal law. These are the spiritual benefits of the new covenant. And those who believe that we today participate, you know, in the covenant by, by means of these spiritual benefits, you know, they're going to claim that these are the benefits that we are participating in. And of course, that would necessitate the ratification of the covenant at the cross, which I have already suggested is a problem, right? Because covenants are ratified not by sacrifices, but by oath. And we see when the oath is taken, clearly in these passages in 
Ezekiel and Hosea and Jeremiah and so forth. Okay, so anyway, what about these spiritual benefits? Letter J, the newness of the new covenant. In fact, I think in your, I think, I, I think there's a, a mistake. I think it goes back to letter G or something. Um, sorry, I didn't get that fixed. I tried to fix everything I could, but I missed that one. Uh, this should be letter J, the newness of the new covenant. You with me right in the middle of page three? I'm sorry, session three, page two, right in the middle, should be letter J, the newness of the new covenant. What is new in the new covenant in my thesis is not the spiritual blessings. There's nothing new about these spiritual blessings. That's why I say too many people think of the new covenant as like, now there's forgiveness of sin. Now there's cleansing from sin. You know, now there's a new heart within you. You look at all of those spiritual blessings and you will discover, I believe, if you study the Old Testament carefully, you will discover that all of those spiritual blessings have always existed for believers of all time. And I've listed that under letter J, the newness of the new covenant. It's not the spiritual blessings, but their universal application. So what's new about the new covenant? It's not cleansing from sin. I, I'm listing here all these bolded spiritual benefits. It's not cleansing from sin because Psalm 51, 2, Numbers 8, 21, talk about cleansing from sin. Before, under the old covenant. It's not a transformed heart. Psalm 51, 10, Ezekiel 18, 31. Talk about having a transformed heart through faith under the old covenant. It's not the internalization of the spirit. It's not having a, a permanent ministry of the spirit. Numbers 27, 18 says that Joshua had, a, had the spirit within him. And that's before the theocratic anointing. Um, Proverbs 1.20 says that if you turn at my reproof, um, I will pour out my spirit on you and you will understand the, the law. You will understand revelation. So you have repentance. You have regeneration through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and you have illumination. Um, there's a, there's a, an extended and I think a very good theological argument that there is a permanent ministry of the Holy Spirit to every believer of all time. And if any of you had McCune for professor, you know he made that argument. And I think he's right. Okay, this is a huge topic. We don't have time to go here. So what's new about the, the, the internal spirit in the church? What's new about Acts 2 and the spirit of God, you know, being in uh, the believers in Acts 2? What's new about that ministry of the Spirit is he's baptizing them into the body of Christ so that they are in Christ and Christ is in them. So the baptism of the Spirit is new in Acts 2. But having a permanent ministry of the Holy Spirit as a regenerated person, that is that the Holy Spirit in every dispensation, in my opinion, and McCune makes this argument and he makes it well, I think, um, in every generation, a person who believes in faith, the revelation of God, can be saved by grace, right? Salvation is always by grace through faith in God's revelation so that the spirit of God, as it were, comes into a person of faith and impregnates them with spiritual life. They're regenerated, right? They're saved. I don't think the Spirit of God then leaves them, pats them on the back and says, good luck, buddy, I hope you do well with this. I think the same Spirit that regenerates them continues to empower that spiritual life so that they can flee Potiphar's wife when she tempts them, or they can stand up to Nebuchadnezzar when he tries to pollute them, right? It's the Spirit of God that enables believers to be sanctified. So every believer through time has been saved by the Spirit and sanctified by the Spirit. What's new about Acts 2 is now the Spirit coming on these disciples represents Christ in them and they are in Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, that never happened before Acts 2. But I think people before that had the Spirit of God. I spent way too much time on that. Email McCune and ask him for those arguments. <laughs>
Okay, so in other words, cleansing from sin is not new. Transformed heart is not new. Holy Spirit internalization is not new. Forgiveness of sin, Psalm 32, Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, blessed is the man to whom the God will not impute iniquity. There's nothing new about the forgiveness of sins. There's nothing new about the law in the heart, Deuteronomy 6. These words which I command you this day shall be on your heart. And look up all these references. Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11, Psalm 37, Psalm 40, Proverbs 3, Proverbs 7, Isaiah 51. And you will find that Old Testament people, that is, people under the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, were supposed to and did, if by faith they believed, they did internalize the law. The law was written on their hearts. There's nothing new about the law being written on your heart in the New Covenant. That was true of believers under the Old Covenant. In fact, they were, everyone under the Old Covenant was supposed to come to God by faith and have the law written on their heart. Read those verses. So what's new about the New Covenant? Here's what's new. Jeremiah 31. I got to go there. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31. Ah, where do we want to start? Verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with who? I will cut, by the way, a new covenant with Israel and Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was an husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, they shall be my people, and they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them, the greatest of them, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. There's nothing new about forgiving their iniquity and sin. Remember no more. What's new? I will write my law on all of their hearts and they will all know me and nobody will have to teach their neighbor to know me. What's new is the universal experience by Israel of these spiritual benefits that have always existed for people who believed and came to God by faith and were regenerated. What's new is that all Israel has these things. So the distinction of the new covenant is compared with the Mosaic. Remember he says here, it's not like the old covenant. Why is it different? The Mosaic covenant was an external covenant written on tables of stone, imposed on mostly unregenerate people who were charged with internalizing it. Do you understand that? It's an external code. It's written on stone. And he came down and read it to them, right? Mostly unregenerate people. He came and read, that, read it to them and they said, all the Lord has commanded, we will do. And in the Deuteronomy passage, God replied by saying, oh, that there were such an heart in them. Deuteronomy 6, these words which I command you externally this day shall be on your heart. You need to internalize this. The Mosaic Code was an external code um, with, with no necessary internal compliance. Not, not everyone complied with it and internalized it. The New Covenant is universal internal compliance, universal. The Mosaic Covenant was individual, not necessarily national regeneration. Hopefully, God said through the Mosaic Covenant, you'll see your sinfulness, you'll see your weakness, you can't keep these laws, you'll come to me by faith and... and be regenerated and have the Spirit of God now who internalizes the law so that you can say with the psalmist, oh, how I love your law, right? It's written on your heart. Hopefully that happens under the, the old covenant. Under the new covenant, there's no hope. There's no hope about it. That's, it's, that is, it's fulfilled. It's, everybody has it. The Mosaic co covenant was pedagogical. It was to teach them to come to faith and internalize the law. The new covenant they will all have the law written on their hearts from day one. Remember, he kicks out all the unbelievers. All Israel is saved. All Israel has the law written on their heart. 
It's not a law for the nation written on stones imposed on people from the outside. It's law cut with the restored nation on their hearts and they all know the Lord from day one. That's what's new about it. Are there compliments to the new covenant? There's at least one. And that's a sacrifice. Zechariah 9 talks about the blood of the covenant. Remember I emphasized the old covenant, the blood of the covenant? Zechariah 9 talks about the blood of the covenant, the new covenant. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22. The upper room, Jesus said, this blood, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Okay, so there is a sacrifice related to the new covenant. Just like there was a sacrifice related to the old covenant. There is covenant blood, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. Hebrews 9, 18 to 20, Hebrews 10, 29, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 13. The sacrifice of Christ is a sacrifice essentially linked to the new covenant. The death of Christ is a sacrifice, the sacrifice directly related to the new covenant. And what it does is guarantee that the new covenant someday will be cut. It categorically, number one, guarantees that the new covenant will be cut with Israel in the eschaton because the sacrifice for that covenant has already taken place. It guarantees the future cutting of that covenant with Israel. But it also, number two, makes possible the soteriological realities for all ages, past as well as future. In other words, the blood of Christ doesn't just guarantee that the new covenant will someday be cut with Israel. The blood of Christ saves everyone who ever has been saved from the beginning of time until the very end of time. Right? Now, hang on to your hats. Beware of the logical and theological fallacies of equating the blood of Christ with the new covenant. Okay, there are some logical fallacies in equating the blood of Christ with the new covenant. First of all, there's the fallacy of identification. That is that the blood of Christ as a sacrifice for the new covenant is the new covenant. No, the blood isn't the new covenant. It's a sacrifice for the new covenant. And, there's, and then there's the law of the undistributed middle. I don't have time to get into that. I talk about it in the book. And, you know, I, I love that. I, lo I love that logical fallacy. I just wish that I had an undistributed middle, right? But that's a whole other topic of discussion. You got to talk to my wife about that one. Um, here's my point. There's also a theological fallacy. Okay, first of all, the logical fallacy is to say that the blood of Christ is the new covenant. Or that if you participate in the blood of Christ, which is a sacrifice for the new covenant, you participate in the new covenant. That's, there, there's a fallacy of the undistributed middle there. Trust me on that. Ask me about it during the Q&A if you want to. We're running out of time here. But there's a theological fallacy as well. Because if you say that everyone who participates in the blood of Christ participates in the new covenant, now you got a problem theologically, in my opinion. Do you think Seth was a believer, son of Adam? I think, he's, I think so. He was a believer saved by faith through grace, based on what, judicially? The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's saved by the blood of Christ, right? Abraham was saved by the blood of Christ, right? Everybody who's ever been saved is saved by the blood of Christ. If being saved by the blood of Christ means you participate in the new covenant, now you have Seth, before there was an old covenant, participating in the new covenant. You have Abraham participating in the new covenant before there's an old covenant. You have Moses who gave the old covenant participating in the new covenant. And David, do you understand the theological fallacy there? To participate in the blood of Christ is to participate in the new covenant. No, logically that's incorrect. Theologically that's a huge problem. The blood of Christ is the sacrifice connected to the new covenant. It makes 
possible the cutting of the new covenant with Israel so that they can all be saved. It guarantees that that new covenant will be cut, but the blood of Christ was shed for everybody who ever believes. That doesn't necessarily put them under the new covenant, which brings us to the next page, the new covenant in the New Testament. And I got like three minutes. <laughs> you got to read the book, okay? Let me quickly give you my conclusions. When you look at the new covenant in the New Testament, it's imperative to read all the New Testament data in light of the Old Testament revelation. You've got to read these texts in light of the Old Testament. The new covenant in the Lord's Supper According to Jesus, Luke 22, this is the new covenant in my blood. Matthew 26 and Mark 14, this is my blood of the covenant. But Matthew 26, 28 says, this is the blood of my covenant poured out for many. Mark adds, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It is the blood of the covenant and it guarantees the new covenant and it makes possible for all Israel to be saved in the new covenant. But this blood is poured out for many. Those under the old covenant, those before the old covenant, those in the church, this blood is poured out for many. It doesn't put them under the new covenant as I understand the text. According to Paul, when he cites this in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, we the church are celebrating the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the Lord, not the new covenant. He says, uh, and you hear this passage every time you do a communion service, right? Um, and so you proclaim the new covenant until I come. Oh, no, no. So you proclaim what? The Lord's death till I come. To do what? Cut the new covenant with Israel and start the millennial kingdom. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Is not the cup which we bless sharing in the blood of Christ? the blood of Christ, which is cut to guarantee and make possible the new covenant is the blood shed for many and it's shed for us and we participate in the blood and we celebrate the blood and we celebrate the death and we remember Christ and remember his death, but we aren't celebrating the new covenant. Although we could, as long as we're celebrating that, that Israel someday will, will have that covenant cut with them. In the remainder of Paul's epistles, and I got one minute, Romans 11, none of us are going to quibble with. The new covenant awaits cutting after the fullness of the Gentiles. And by the way, in Romans 11, it's cut with Jacob, cut with Israel, not with the church. And it's cut after the times of the Gentiles. 2 Corinthians 3 is the toughest passage for people to wrap their head around. 2 Corinthians 3 um, where Paul says, you know, aren't we ministers of the new covenant? There's no article there. He actually says we are ministers of a new covenant. I would argue that that, that, that an Arthurus noun is qualitative. That is, we are ministers of a new covenant kind, not of the letter kind, not of the old covenant. We're not an extra. We aren't preaching an external gospel and imposing it on unsaved people. We are preaching a gospel that's inside of people and changes them from the inside out. That's a new covenant kind of ministry, but it's not ministering the new covenant. There's a great article by George Gunn uh, at Shasta Bible College, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Um, the church's relationship with the new covenant where he argues the view that I'm taking here, that Paul is simply drawing an analogy there between his ministry and a new covenant kind of ministry, but he's not saying that he's ministering the new covenant. Read that article. It's very interesting. The new covenant in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews nowhere alters, but perfectly confirms Old Testament teaching regarding the new covenant. And I list it all there. You can look it up and study it on your own. Let me quickly read this conclusion. And forgive me for insulting your intelligence by reading it and going over time, but I'm going to read it anyway. If the new covenant was ratified at the cross, it must have been actuated by different means than other ancient Near Eastern and biblical covenants because they're ratified by oath, not by sacrifice. If the new covenant was ratified at the cross, the time and place of new covenant enactment 
must have been reappointed, for the prophets make multiple references to the time and place of New Covenant ratification, all of which are yet future to the church. If it was ratified at the cross, the covenant must somehow have been ratified with peoples other than those foretold by the prophets, for the prophets describe a bilateral ratification of the covenant by its stated legal parties, God and Israel. If the church, for example, participates in the spiritual benefits of the new covenant, then the church somehow does so prior to new covenant ratification as explicitly described in the Old Testament. If the church participates in spiritual new covenant benefits, then some of the spiritual benefits promised to Israel by the prophets must have been attended by significant modification for Israel was never predicted to have an internalized spirit who would baptize them into the body of Christ on equal standing with Gentiles. And the body of Christ, the church, was never promised to have a theocratic kingdom law inscribed on their hearts. If the church participates in the new covenant by virtue of participating in the blood of Christ, then every person redeemed since the creation of the world participates in the new covenant because every regenerate person of all time participates in the blood of Christ. Therefore, if the new covenant was ratified at the cross and if the church participates in some or any of the promised legal benefits, then the new covenant must have undergone numerous substantive changes from its Old Testament predictions, none of which are infallibly recorded in Scripture. In point of fact, it can be demonstrated that no New Testament reference to the new covenant in any way alters any description, temporal reference, legal benefit, or stated party to the new covenant as explicitly and recurrently depicted in the Old Testament text. Certainly the church participates in some soteriological benefits like our promise to Israel, the new covenant, but that fact in no way means that the church then participates in the new covenant itself. The difference between these two affirmations may seem small, but the implications are biblically, theologically, and hermeneutically profound. And that's it. <laughs> Do we go right into Q&A or? Yes. Okay, Q&A, here we go. And we have till 1220. Okay, here's what I'm gonna to try to do. I'm sure I could take each one of these questions and ten, spend 10 minutes on it. I'm gonna to try to answer it concisely, specifically what you ask. If you wanna chase it further, let me know. But I'm gonna to try to be brief so we can get many questions in. I saw a hand over here. Um, why do you begin the mediatorial kingdom with Sinai when the creation account seems to include the necessary covenant um, okay, can everyone hear that? Why do I start the kingdom at Sinai when the creation seems to include all of the covenant elements? Um, the, the quick answer is, I don't believe there is a creation covenant as such. I did state in my chart that God objectified his rule first through Adam, right? He made him as his image and his likeness and said rule over. Of course, he failed in that. So God eventually took Abraham and is going to create an ethnic group and make of them a, a theocratic kingdom in miniature. But quick answer is I don't think there is a, uh, there's, there's not an Edenic covenant that I find anywhere. Um, and the mediatorial kingdom as a kingdom begins then at Mount Sinai. Saw a hand over here back there, yes. Yes. Okay. His understanding is that Darby's view was that the church does not participate in the new covenant, we just participate in the blood, right? So he's suggesting that Darby's view has been equated with my view. Um, I believe that's correct. Um, others like Pentecost and others draw that same conclusion that that was Darby's view. In this book, uh, Mike Stollard, the editor, is gonna take a, a, have a little different take on that. He's gonna say that's not Darby's view. It's debated. Darby is not always clear on his view, but I think when push comes to shove, I disagree with Stollard. I agree with Pentecost. I think Darby's view 
was that um, we do not participate in any legal sense in the new covenant. We just participate in the blood of the covenant, which gives us some benefits like Israel. So I think my view does equate with Darby's, but that's debated. I remember when I first was formulating my view and I came to these conclusions and I read Pentecost and it's like, this is Darby's view. My view is like Darby's view. It's like, okay, great. Now I'm caught in a, you know, between a rock and a hard place because to say that my view is the same as Darby's is like to, you know, to claim connection to the worst theologian on the planet according to covenant theologians, right? It's like, I don't want to claim Darby because now they're really going to think I'm stupid. Um, but anyway, I think my view is Darby's view, that, but it's debated. Okay? Yes, sir. When you talk about the law and the heart, how do you see um, Paul's comments in Romans 2, specifically verse 15, where he talks about the law of God and the heart of the Gentiles? Okay, so how does Paul's statement in Romans 2 about the law being written on the hearts of the Gentiles? Um, I think, and again, this is New Testament. I don't know anything about the New Testament. Um, (laughs) I don't think Paul, Paul, it seems very clear in the context, is saying that all humans have an internalized law. I think what Paul is talking there about is the conscience, right? Um, Which is God-inscribed law on even unregenerate people, so to speak. Um, You know, is he maybe drawing an analogy with the Old Testament internalization law? I, I guess in my mind, my quick answer is it seems to me like he's talking about a Apples and oranges. It's, it's a different thing. Uh, but maybe that's a cop-out. I'd, I'd have to think about it. You know what? I, I, in other words, I think there he's talking about the conscience on every hum, of every human being, including the Gentiles, um, which is different than the Mosaic law from God should be inscribed on the hearts of Israel and someday will be. Uh, I think that's different than the conscience. I think it's apples and oranges. Uh, so on the other hand, yes. Is the modern word contract like technically connected or just comparable to? Comparable to, modern contract comparable to a covenant. I'd have to think a lot about that and maybe I'd paint myself in a corner, but to me, at least in the sense that we think of contracts as something you sign and then becomes legally binding. In that sense, I would say it's, in other words, a contract, again, is different than just a general agreement. You see people in the people's court, you know, this guy said he'd fix my kitchen. Well, did he sign a, no. Well, then you're, you're out. So in other words, contracts have to be signed to be in force. I would see that as parallel. I don't know how far I'd take the rest of The contract is more a business thing, but I need to let that one go and move on. Yes? Do use marriage as an illustration of uh, ratification or, or the oath of a, a covenant? What sort of a covenant would you say marriage is? Is it a parallel to Huh. Never been asked that one. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a marriage covenant. It's, it's, <laughs> it is. It's a marriage covenant. Um, the, the marriage covenant... It, the illustration is used in Hosea of a marriage covenant with God's covenant with Israel. So I guess the best I could say is it's like some biblical covenants in that it's bilateral and enforced by oath. Uh, On the other hand, a marriage covenant is to bind two individuals together in a union. A suzerainty covenant is binding a sovereign and a nation together. So there's similarities, but... A marriage covenant is a marriage covenant, and they are in the Bible too. Yeah. Yes, sir. In what sense did Paul use the term uh, identifying uh, 
himself and others as able ministers of the New Testament. In what sense did Paul use the term able ministers of the New Covenant? And that's the 1 Corinthians 3 passage. And my quick answer is um, he's using an analogy there. The, the, uh, the New Covenant there is an arthritis. It doesn't say we're ministers of the New Covenant. He says we're ministers of a New Covenant. Some early dispensationalists took that to mean, well, there must be a new covenant for the church. There's two new covenants. That's some of the guys out of Dallas, and that's unfortunate they took that view. I don't think it's saying there's a new covenant for the church. I think that you have in that passage a series of analogies. I think there's like eight analogies that Paul draws between his ministry to the Corinthians and what his ministry is and what his ministry isn't. What it's like and what it isn't like. And he likens it to a new covenant kind of ministry, not an old covenant kind of ministry, but it's an analogy. He's not saying he ministers the new covenant. And again, I would refer you to that article by George Gunn. It's a great article. And I think you all need to read it. Yes, sir. A quick follow up to the marriage covenant question. So basically what you were suggesting is that there's not only the categories of covenants that are listed in the handout, but there's potential for other kinds of covenants. Okay, good point. And I could have said this earlier, but I didn't. Maybe I should have. In fact, I thought of putting it at the notes when I was putting this all together. Are there other covenants in the scriptures that I haven't talked about? Yes. Um, I can't remember if it's Gentry and Wellam in Kingdom Through Covenant, or if it's their follow-up book on progressive covenantalism, but somewhere in there, they list a bunch of different kinds of covenants in the Old Testament, like marriage covenants, and I can't remember, all friendship covenants, David and Jonathan, you know, whatever. So there are other kinds of covenants in the Bible, but when we're talking about the Abrahamic, Davidic, Mosaic, and New, they are comparable to these two covenants. Though the other covenants could be used to illustrate them like a marriage covenant. And all of those covenants are also bound by what, what actuates them, oath. Yeah. Uh, way in the back. With respect to the three covenants, I think you were rejecting the idea that the three are subsumed in the new covenant. Yes. The land promise of the new covenant is essentially the land promise of the Abrahamic, but Correct. Yes. Okay. Good question. And it clarifies stuff. And I thought, I thought about this, but I didn't have time to say everything. So here's the question. He said that I reject the idea that the new covenant kind of subsumes all the covenants. And yes, I do reject that. He said, well, there are land promises in the new covenant. There's land promises in the Davidic covenant. Land promises in the Abrahamic covenant, all of which you know, are fulfilled at the same time in the millennial kingdom. And that's true. In my opinion, there's a difference between all of the covenants, you know, being poured, like, like turn the bottom umbrella over and you pour all the other covenants in there and they all become one big soup that's fulfilled in the new covenant. No, they all have their distinct place in the umbrella system, Abrahamic creates an ethnic group. Mosaic creates a, a kingdom, a constitution for nation. Davidic is the ruler over that. The new covenant just bumps out the old covenant as the constitution. But when the new covenant is cut with Israel, right, it's cut in the land. They're given the land promised to Abraham. They're given the land promised under the Mosaic covenant. They're given the land promised under David. So in other words, all of the covenants do find ultimate fulfillment in the millennial kingdom when Israel is functioning under the new covenant, but that doesn't make them all one big new covenant soup. In other words, what covenant theologians are doing in, in making this one big soup is like, so everything is spiritualized in the new covenant and it's all fulfilled in the new covenant in a way different than predicted in the Old Testament. It's all fulfilled in Christ in a typological way and it's just one big soup you know, that happens in a different way than originally predicted. No, there are still three distinct 
covenants, but they're all ultimately fulfilled at the same time. That is, the, the Abrahamic finds ultimate fulfillment in the, in, the, in the kingdom of Jesus for a thousand years. The Mosaic covenant is replaced by the new covenant and finds fulfillment in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. The Davidic covenant finds ultimate fulfillment in the millennial kingdom with a Davidic king sitting on the throne, but they're individual covenants finding individual fulfillment. They're not one big soup, you know, that's all new covenant. Does that make sense? Does that distinction make sense? I think so. Paul, just briefly, when you said you're different, you need to put the all flesh and the The other covenants were in abeyance essentially because of the relationship. All plus Anomia is going to restore that, which is why once it's laying on, it can come back. Does that make sense? So the all the all flesh will know me, or all Israel will know me. Words, Ask it again. What triggers in the new covenant? What triggers that restoration to the land of, of the Abrahamic promises? So I okay. I guess I would be okay with saying that Jesus cutting the new covenant with Israel after the 70th week and the regathering and the discriminating judgment, Jesus cutting that covenant with all regenerate Israel so that all Israel is saved, and that's the constitution of the new kingdom, is, the word you used is trigger. I don't have a problem saying that triggers, you know, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic land promise and the Davidic royal promise, all of it, is tied to, yeah, the, the new covenant being cut with Israel so that the land promises can be fulfilled and the Davidic covenant can be fulfilled. It's a trigger is fine. A soup is not good. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. How does the uh, ceremonial, in your view, how does the ceremonial sacrifice uh, fit into cutting the new co covenant? How does the ceremonial sacrifice fit in the cutting of the new covenant? Well, the ceremonial sacrifice, I, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. <laughs> I tell my students that all the time. The ceremonial sacrifice for the cutting of the new covenant is the death of Jesus on the cross. No, they instituted an actual ceremonial sacrifice of animals, oh. as I understand it. In okay. Place. So, he says, but they, but they institute animal sacrifice in the kingdom, right? Yes. When, when God restores the kingdom to Israel, I love Micah 6, 4, or 5. Funny, I love it, but I can't think of it right now. Um, <laughs> o tower of the flock, it will come to you. Even the former dominion will come to Israel. So when Christ comes a second time and weeds out the unbelieving Jews, cuts the covenant with believing Jews, triggering the land promises being fulfilled, the Davidic covenant being fulfilled. Jesus is going to rule from Zion on a Davidic throne in the actual land of Palestine where Israel will dwell as a nation, all the other nations around them. Remember, and all the nations are weeded out so that they are all believing when the, when the covenant begins. When the new covenant becomes the constitution and it says the law is written on their heart, maybe that law is somewhat different than the Mosaic law. I don't know. That's an interesting question. Nobody's asked yet. But I see it as probably very similar to the Mosaic law because we know we're going to have a sanctuary in Jerusalem. There's going to be a temple. There's going to be worship. There's going to be sacrifices. Um, they're, they're, you know... Gentiles will grab a hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, take us up to worship with you. There'll be the Sabbath, there'll be feasts, there'll be all kinds of stuff uh, because he's restoring the historic kingdom to Israel in pretty much the same form it was before, except what's different? They will all know me and the law's on their heart. So yeah, there will be sacrifices and so forth. Maybe you're asking, how are those sacrifices going to function? Okay, okay. so this is a big question and McCune had an answer. My answer is a little different than his. How are those sacrifices in the millennial kingdom functioning? You know, a lot of people say 
sacrifice of the Old Testament look forward to the death of Christ, sacrifice of the millennium look back at the death of Christ. And to some extent that's true. But a quick answer, this could be an hour lecture. I think the sacrifices in the millennial temple will, will function the same way they did in the original temple tabernacle. That is, Joe Blow from Kokomo broke the law, the Mosaic law. Well, let's say Joe Blow from, you know, Beersheba. <laughs> <laughs> we can't use Joe Blow anymore. Anyway, so, so, you know, Mr. X under the old covenant breaks the law. According to Leviticus, he brings a sacrifice he, he, you know, confesses his sins. He lays himself on it. He slits the throat. The blood is sprinkled a certain way. And if all of that happens, it says that sin is forgiven him. Is, is Joe Blow from Beersheba a believer? Does that impact his vertical relationship to God? No. That Old Testament sacrifice is working on a horizontal level. For everybody, whether believers or not, it's paying the fine for, you know, the way I say it is going too fast on Highway 55 in Plymouth, so to speak. Um, in the Old Testament, you're paying the fine for breaking the law, whether you're a believer or not, that sacrifice is paying that fine. What God wants that to teach you in the Old Covenant is that you can't bring enough sacrifices to pay for your sins. You sinned. By the time you walk out, you've sinned again, right? You can't bring enough of those. So you're going to have to come to God and say, God, I can't keep this law. I can't bring enough sacrifices. Will you somehow have mercy on me and save me just because you're gracious? And God says, bingo, Joe Blow from Beersheba. You got it. That's what I want you to know. And at that moment, that man is impregnated with spiritual life by the Holy Spirit and has a vertical relationship with God by grace through faith based judicially on the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now when he sins after that, he still broke the law. He's got to bring his sacrifice to pay the fine, right? But now he's also restoring his fellowship with God. It becomes for him a 1 John 1, 9 thing for believers in the Old Testament. But my point is, Old Testament sacrifices worked on a horizontal level to pay for offenses against the state and the theocrat. In the millennial kingdom, if you speed down I, what goes through Detroit? 94. If you're speeding on I-94 in the millennial kingdom and you get pulled over by Michigan's finest and it's the millennial kingdom and you broke the law, you got to take a sacrifice and you got to pay the fine. Now, does that mean every time, you know, somebody broke a law, they had to go to Jerusalem and offer sacrifice? No, I think they saved up in their brain their sins until the three feasts when they had to go up and sacrifice, and then they confessed those sins and so forth. It's a big lecture, but that's more than you wanted to know, and that wasn't a quick answer. I hope I answered it. Yes, sir. I have a question. Is there any big difference in the understanding the only thing that pops in, is there a difference between covenants in Old Testament times and New Testament times? And I almost wish you wouldn't have asked that question because there's a verse in Hebrews that, forgive me, Lord, I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> but the author of Hebrews does make one analogy in the book with a will. You know, that is a will. Somebody has to die before it's in force. Um, and so the, that diatheke, I think, in Hebrews is actually a comparison with a will, which is different than anything talked about in the Old Testament. But we need to be careful that we, you know, I th again, I think the author of Hebrews there is referring to a kind of covenant that's not ever talked about in the Old Testament. But an analogy is being drawn with Christ. That maybe didn't answer your question, but that popped into my brain. Yes, sir. Uh, do we have any examples of this in the different covenants of a separation of time between the symbolic sacrifice huh. and the actual magic? So, is there any ancient Near Eastern sacrifice where there's this 
you know, this gap of time between the sacrifice and the cutting of the covenant. Number one, I can't answer that because I haven't read every ancient or Eastern covenant. I don't know that there is. But, but, but it brings up the big question. I mean, the elephant in the room is, how can there be a sacrifice for the new covenant 2,000 years before the covenant is cut? I mean, that kind of bugs people. And here's my answer to that. Um, well, first of all, God's in charge and he makes those decisions. But think about this. How can the Davidic king be born even before the sacrifice of the new covenant is made? The Davidic king is born, but he's not enthroned for longer than before the new covenant is cut. You see what I'm saying? If, if, the, if the new covenant sacrifice can be separated from its cut, the cutting of the covenant by 2,000 years, the enthronement of the Davidic king is separated by even a longer time from his birth. It's just the way God's plan is working in time so that Christ could be rejected, so that there could be the times of, you know, the church and the, the pouring out of God's work through this new thing during the advance of the kingdom so that you and I could be saved and be a part of that coming kingdom, you know, yeah, there's a long time between the cutting of the covenant and sacrifice. There's also a long time between the birth of the king and his enthronement. And probably other illustrations can be drawn. But I don't know of any, you know, I can't take you to any other covenant that does that. I have a different question. When you're teaching through Hosea chapter 2, how do you apply that to your audience? Peter, Peter applies it, right, by analogy that, you know, God has called a people that aren't his people, his people in the church. He's not saying we're fulfilled. I mean, mo you know, many covenant theologians and others are going to say, well, there's a, you know, spiritual fulfillment. No, it's an analogy. Just like Peter says, we are a chosen seed, a royal nation. You know, we need to be holy like God. He draws analogies between us and Israel um, in, in the way that we should model God living, just like Israel was supposed to model, model God living. So Peter draws an analogy, doesn't he, between Hosea, not my people are called my people, but that's an analogy. Um, and so that's the way I would use it. I mean, I, I would preach it that this directly says that someday God is going to restore Israel and he's going to remarry the prostitute that left him, Right? But now today, Israel is not modeling God. The church has been called to model God. And we, who are certainly not his people, are now called his people in some sense, not that we replace Israel. And so we need to model God like Israel modeled God. And if we fail in modeling God, just like Israel, the world will have no one to look at to see what God living is like, so forth. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, the Mosaic Covenant disobedience but was made obsolete by Christ. Yes. Um, when we look at passages like in Jeremiah 3 where it talks about because of Israel's disobedience God writes a certificate of divorce and I'm almost the annulment of covenant a marriage covenant where we have we make a distinction between the Mosaic covenant and the marital language used to describe the relationship between God and his people. Wow. I was looking at the clock because that's got to be our last question, and now I kind of lost track of the question. Um, <laughs> can you state it again in a sure. was, succinct way? The language in Jeremiah 3 where God says, I'm writing you a certificate of divorce. Because to national divorce. Israel under the Old Covenant. Right. Yep. So we make a distinction on surface level that sounds like the covenant being a new ah. Israel disobedience. Sure. There are a lot of times where God says you've broken the covenant and, you know, therefore bad stuff's going to happen. But go all the way back to Deuteronomy um, and the blessings and the curses, and that's the, that's the curses, you know. The divorcement is, is a curse. It's not an annulment, if that makes any sense. And that had to be our last question. Sorry. So, Brother Dave, thank you so much.